Today's video is intentionally ad-free, as we do not wish to profit off coverage of alleged racism. Warning, today's video tackles a very serious topic and very serious allegations being made against Tesla, some of its employees and its management. It centers around a civil court case filed by the Department of Fair Employment and Housing in the state of California against Tesla and 50 defendants at the company. In discussing the court case and the several years of investigation which led to it, we will be discussing racism in the workplace, including the allegations of widespread use of racial slurs, racist imagery and racist graffiti, in addition to allegedly overtly racially motivated discrimination in the workplace by the defendants against black and or African-American employees and contractors at Tesla's various facilities in California. To properly cover this, portions of filed court papers containing examples of all of the above will be shared in this video. Those of you watching with younger audience members may wish to review this content first. This channel has a zero tolerance attitude towards racism. We also believe that it is important to appropriately discuss and educate on the topics of historical and ongoing discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, disability, sexuality or gender identity. In the description to this video, you'll find a link to resources appropriate to different age groups to help facilitate age appropriate discussion across all generations. If you were intending to watch this with a younger audience, we'd strongly suggest discussing those topics first before continuing. For those impacted by the topics discussed in this video, you will also find links to resources and support organizations in the description below. Additionally, because this video includes some pretty long quotes, we're going to put quoted text on screen while they are read out. Tesla and its CEO Elon Musk are hailed around the world for the work that they have put in to accelerate the world's transition away from fossil fuels and onto clean, renewable sources of energy. Tesla's vehicles have dominated the electric vehicle marketplace for nearly a decade and are widely credited with dragging rival automakers into electrification, as well as leading the electric vehicle investment excitement that we see today. But alongside the kickstart that Tesla has given the automotive industry, there have been persistent and continued allegations made against Tesla over its treatment of staff, its approach to health and safety in the workplace, and its workplace ethics. At the heart of it all are persistent allegations of racial discrimination, and today we're going to delve into them after the California Department for Employment and Housing, or DFEH, filed a massive civil suit last week against Tesla in court. That suit identifies hundreds of complaints from current and former workers, both salaried staff and contracted staff, the latter meaning that they were hired via an agency on a temporary basis, alleging a hostile and racist work environment. The deeply disturbing breadth of these allegations span everything from the physical environment through employee treatment and recompense, and in some cases, constructive dismissal, that's essentially forcing people to resign or leave. The plant, which is now known as Tesla's Fremont facility, was once known as NUMI, a joint venture between General Motors and Toyota, and before being jointly owned, it was a wholly owned and operated General Motors plant, a plant known in the area for its poor reputation, rampant corruption, and what was openly considered the, quote, worst workforce in the automobile industry in the United States. And no, I'm not exaggerating. Follow the link in the description below for a special episode of This American Life from 2015 in which the plant's history is laid bare. When we first heard about this particular filing, we as a team contemplated if this was related to just the Fremont plant and its troubled past. But on closer reading, the complaint covers much more than just Fremont. It includes Tesla's Lathrop plant and cites problems that appear to extend beyond manufacturing alone. In other words, the prosecution lays out pretty compelling evidence that this is endemic at the automaker, not just a problem at one specific location. Yet, 
in this case, understanding the history of Numi may help explain where things are today, so let's do that. The Fremont plant, which eventually became Numi and then Tesla Fremont, was built to replace the first auto manufacturing plant on the US West Coast, Chevrolet's Oakland assembly plant, which opened back in 1916. Cars started rolling off the production line at Oakland's replacement, the brand new plant in Fremont, in 1961, at a time when discrimination wasn't just legal, it was very clearly the law of the land. The plant's production peaked in the 1970s, but by then the relationship between workers and supervisors had soured to the point that one in five workers wouldn't turn up and managers were literally pulling people off the streets to work the production line. Quality and output fell and fell, and by 1982, GM had given up and shuttered its troubled factory. Then Toyota and GM agreed to work together to reopen the plant. Toyota would teach GM staff Toyota's quality production methods, and Numi became a standout facility among GM factories. The vehicles produced at Numi were better put together, and it's been suggested that the techniques there could have prevented GM's bankruptcy if it had been spread throughout the company. But when GM went under and Toyota was left operating the formerly joint-owned plant, its only unionised plant in the US, it decided that it was done too. After the plant closed and some of the machinery was auctioned off, Tesla stepped in, purchased the facility, and what machinery remained. The plant was refitted and reworked, with more environmentally friendly water-based paint equipment installed, changes to the production line to enable production of the then-new Tesla Model S sedan, and all of this was finished off with a brighter, white, painted interior. It was a really pleasant facility. But alongside those positive transformations, the allegations made indicate that the previously inclusive environment, cited back in 1994 by MIT's management review as being an exemplar in the auto industry of an inclusive and diverse workplace, had also been transformed into one in which sexual harassment and racism appeared pervasive. That said, Racism is not just a Tesla problem. GM has battled with racism at several of its plants, including white supremacists hanging nooses in the bathroom at one of its facilities. At Ford's Lima, Ohio facility, workers have protested racial abuse. And this is unacceptable behaviour at any facility. It is abhorrent in any civilised society. And it is fair to say that from our research, it has been a severe and endemic problem at many automotive production facilities across the US. Both those companies gave lacklustre responses to their complaints about their respective facilities, and as a result, some employment cases made it to trial. For every case that did make it to trial, it is also fair to assume many Many others were never reported, and tackling racism in the workplace is something that every single company, including automakers, need to work a lot harder on. Yet, there are a few factors that really make this Tesla case exceptional. One is the apparent failure of any kind of significant response from senior management. Another is the duration and the breadth of the complaints. And the third is the official response of Tesla to the allegations. The DFEH suit identifies complaints that span for almost the entire period of the plant's operation under Tesla's ownership and includes threats, mistreatment, abuse, the physical environment and job roles, the supervisory staff and the shop floor workers. And seen on the background of Tesla's seeming inability to hold on to its heads of HR and inclusivity and diversity, the two most recent both being women of colour, Felicia Mayo left after just two years and Valerie Capers Workman left after just 18 months, and on the background of multiple cases of sexual harassment and previous cases complaining of racism, including a recent one $137 million award, which, as a side note, we should mention, Tesla is appealing. This all points to a troubling culture. So 
what does California's Department of Fair Employment and Housing say is going on behind Tazza's closed doors? Just a reminder from this point forward, we will be including quotes from the suit which contain language that is deeply offensive. But we also feel it's necessary to illustrate the culture that the DFEH allege has been allowed to thrive. And yes, where possible, we are also including Tazla's responses to these allegations as of the time of filming this video. The suit indicates that the investigation has been ongoing for three years, during which time DFEH received, quote, hundreds of complaints from workers and, quote, served many to Tesla. It also states that it made several attempts to remediate the situation with Tesla, but that Tesla did not participate in the first two attempts made at mediation. It then indicates that a later meeting with Tesla did not end positively. The suit also states that, quote, In the course of DFEH's investigation, DFEH found evidence that defendants subjected its black and or African-American workers to racial harassment and discriminated against them in the terms and conditions of employment, including assignment, discipline, promotion, termination, and constructive discharge. DFEH's investigation also found that the defendants retaliated against its black and or African-American workers when they complained or reported the harassment or discrimination. Further, DFEH's investigation found that defendants failed to take all reasonable steps necessary to prevent unlawful discrimination, harassment or retaliation. DFEH's investigation also found that defendants paid black and or African-American workers less than workers of another race or ethnicity for substantially similar work. DFEH's investigation also found that the defendants required black and or African-American workers to waive rights, forums and or procedures as a condition of employment, continued employment or the receipt of any employment related benefit. The suit then goes on to allege that Tesla failed to adequately train its supervisors in managing racially motivated incidents or to properly document when complaints of racist treatment were made. In the filing, DFEH then goes on to document that, quote, Black and or African-American workers are segregated to the lowest levels. While black and or African-American workers make up 0% of executives and about 3% of professionals at the Fremont plant, about 20% of the factory operatives, such as engine and other machine assemblers, are black and or African-American. Black and or African-American workers were also overrepresented in Tesla's contract workforce. However, black and or African Americans are severely underrepresented as officials and managers, executives, senior officials and managers, first mid-officials and managers and professionals. You'll note the use of the word overrepresented there in the filing, and it's probably helpful to explain that. According to US census data from 2019, just 3.06% of the population of Fremont, California where Tesla's Fremont facility is, were black and or African-American. This means that most of the black and or African-American workforce were traveling into Fremont from adjacent areas. The filing identifies Tesla's Fremont facility as a segregated workplace where there is an absence of black and or African-American individuals in leadership roles. It describes an environment where repeated use of the N-word and racial slurs to refer to black and or African-American workers was unchallenged. An environment where references to the Ku Klux Klan and swastikas were etched into the walls of restrooms, stalls, lunch tables and factory machinery. In one case, a black worker observed hang N-word penned next to the drawing of a noose in the break restroom. They told the prosecution that the image and the text were kept up on the wall for several months prior to its removal. In addition to graffiti at the facility that clearly showed Confederate flags, nooses, white supremacist skulls and swastikas, some white workers deliberately and openly showed racist and white supremacist tattoos in front of black and or African-American workers. These tattoos included ones 
of the Confederate flag. The complaint states that, quote, Throughout the day, every day, black and or African-American workers heard defendants' workers, leads, supervisors and managers make racial slurs and comments about black workers. Examples of the racist language included the N-word, quote, porch monkey, monkey toes, boy, hood rats and horsehair. Defendants' workers, including production leads and supervisors, made references to black and or African Americans in racist comments and racist jokes such as, quote, N-word out of the hood, from the ghetto, Tesla was hiring lazy C blank blank NS, and go back to Africa. Because the factory was racially segregated, defendants' workers referred to the areas where many black and or African Americans worked as the, quote, porch monkey station. Defendants' workers with tattoos of the Confederate flag made their racially incendiary tattoos visible to intimidate black and or African American workers. Racial slurs were also dispensed in Spanish and included mayete and negrita. Additionally, defendants' workers referred to the Tesla factory as, quote, the slave ship or the plantation, where defendants' production leads cracked the whip. Many black and or African-American workers understood these terms to be references to how defendants treated its black and or African-American workers. One black worker heard these racial slurs as often as 50 to 100 times a day. At which point you'd assume in that workplace that you'd be getting your manager in pretty sharpish to deal with a deeply hostile environment. You'd expect disciplinary action for the staff involved in making those comments. You'd expect a great deal of diversity training and probably a few people to find themselves hunting for new jobs and lacking a positive job reference. But DFEH paints a different picture. Damningly, DFEH goes on to state that leads, supervisors and managers were active participants and or witnesses and that supervisors would use phrases such as, quote, that stupid N-word, or, quote, that effing N-word, I can't stand them. Complaining that black workers were, quote, not Tesla material? And, well, let's just go back to another quote from the suit. Defendant supervisors complained about where black and or African-American workers were assigned, saying, quote, monkeys work outside, and, quote, Monkeys need a coat in cold weather. A supervisor pointedly asked one African-American worker, quote, do most Africans have bones through their noses? Another African-American worker reported that a group of defendants production leads often laughed at her whenever she walked by them. These leads muttered the N-word or shut up N-word to her at first. When she started getting awards for her work performance, these leads openly called her these racial slurs. A previous lawsuit against Tesla from 2017, when racism was already a major problem at Fremont, quoted an internal email from Elon Musk in which he addressed some of the allegations against Tesla in ways that some might view as gaslighting as it focuses on Tesla's goals rather than the heart of the matter, racial discrimination. He wrote, quote, Tesla has to be hardcore and demanding, not for the hell of it, but because we are fighting for a good cause against giant entrenched competitors who just want the status quo to continue. The list of companies that want to kill Tesla is so long, I've lost track. A week doesn't go by without some Tesla killer article. The only way for a little company to prevail against those much larger companies is to work faster, smarter, and harder. The passing grade at Tesla is excellence because it has to be. However, this does not give license to anyone to be a jerk. It is incredibly important that people look forward to coming to work in the morning. One of the best feelings in the world is to be part of a team that is fired up to achieve what most industry experts say is impossible. For many companies out there, work is like jail. Employees look forward to Friday and dread Monday. That's horrible. We never want to be like that. Part of not being a huge jerk is considering how someone might feel who is part of a historically less represented group. They have endured difficulties that someone born or raised in a more privileged situation did not. 
This doesn't mean that there is a different standard of performance or that you can't give critical feedback. You should. Doing anything else would be an insult to the hard work it took to get there. But don't ever intentionally allow someone to feel excluded, uncomfortable, or unfairly treated. Sometimes these things happen unintentionally, in which case you should apologize. In fairness, if someone is a jerk to you but sincerely apologizes, it is important to be thick-skinned and accept that apology. If you are part of a less represented group, you don't get a free pass on being a jerk yourself. We have had a few cases at Tesla where someone in a less represented group was actually given a job or promoted over more qualified, highly represented candidates and then decided to sue Tesla for millions of dollars because they felt they weren't promoted enough. That is obviously not cool. What it comes down to is this. Do what would make your parents proud. That narrative, downplaying allegations and dismissing them, has remained a constant throughout the time that Tesla has been sued for racial discrimination, addressing a larger enemy rather than tackling the problem that led to unrest. Well, it never ends well. It also paints a somewhat different picture than the metriocratic system that tech folks often like to paint of high-tech workplaces. And at this point, you might be thinking that if you work for a company that's focused on high-tech solutions to the world's problems, they would be pretty hot on keeping accurate records of everything that goes on at its facilities. In Tesla's case, however, the DFEH alleges a chronic issue with Tesla's record keeping, at least when it comes to these complaints and how they were resolved. Under various California statutes, there are certain standards which must be met when it comes to recording discrimination and harassment complaints. In fact, any personnel or employment record made or kept by an employer or agents acting on its behalf for things like payroll, taxes or benefits must be kept for a period of two years from the date that that record is created. Records surrounding things like wages and wage rates, job classifications and other conditions of employment must be kept for a period of three years. In its filing, the DFEH states that despite sending Tesla a document retention notice at the start of its administrative investigation, that's basically a legal document telling Tesla it cannot destroy, conceal or alter any documents relative to the complaints being filed against it, regardless of when they happened, it discovered numerous partially missing employee records and personnel files. Missing information included documentation concerning internal investigations into allegations made against numerous employees. Incomplete records, the DFEH argues, makes it difficult to investigate the claims and also makes it hard to protect those who have made allegations from retaliatory actions. Improper record keeping also makes it harder for some of the other allegations in the case to be properly investigated. At the top of the list, salary disparity between black and or African-American workers and other workers at Tesla. Under US Labor Code 1197.5, it is illegal for employers to differentiate salaries of individuals based on their race or ethnicity for substantially similar work when viewed as a composite of skill, effort and responsibility and when performed under similar working conditions. Yet the court papers show black and or African-American workers received a lower base pay and less incentive pay, bonuses, equity or benefits when compared to non-black counterparts when their jobs involved carrying out substantially similar work as each other. As an aside, the city of Fremont, where Tesla's Fremont facility is located, lists the black poverty rate as being 8.52% and that is versus 9.55% for native peoples and 5.69% for those who are white. Because this complaint is so extensive, there are 50 anonymous defendants listed alongside Tesla, we do not have the time to go through every single allegation. 
That said, I think it's worth noting here that the DFEH has a reputation in California for only prosecuting cases it feels confident have merit and it can win. It has in the past and continues to this day to reject cases it doesn't feel confident of. For the DFEH to take on this case shows that it believes there is serious merit. That said, we would be completely negligent in our role if we didn't reiterate that right now these are just allegations and under US law you are innocent until you are proven guilty. Which brings us to Tesla's defence as it stands on record right now. While we've not seen Tesla's official legal rebuttal to the case, we've seen several statements made by Tesla regarding both this case and previous cases. In response to an earlier case from 2017, Tesla's then head of inclusivity and diversity, Valerie Capers Workman, said in a blog post on Tesla's website on the topic of alleged racial discrimination and name calling that, quote, This is a complicated social issue, but at Tesla, it's a distraction away from our mission to try to debate the acceptable and prohibited use of these words. So we don't. Tesla expressly forbids all such slurs, epithets, or derogatory expressions based on any characteristic a person may have, regardless of intent. And per our long-standing policies, we will take immediate disciplinary action if we find that any employee has used these words towards anyone at our work locations. And we've already covered Elon Musk's response to that earlier 2017 case in this video. Yet it's also worth noting that on social media since this particular case was filed. There's been a lot of discussion about the case. Responding to a tweet earlier this week from an account belonging to a well-known Tesla fan that suggests that Tesla's drawing attention from various government bodies, including the DEFH, NHTSA, the SEC and the California Department of Motor Vehicles, was all because Tesla was upsetting unions, legacy auto and the oil industry while simultaneously not paying for ads or political sway. Musk simply quoted to that tweet, exactly. At face value, this appears to be an attempt to downplay the case and is certainly echoed by Tesla's official statement on it as published on its website on February 9th, 2022, entitled The DFEH's Misguided Lawsuit. It reads as follows. The California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, DFEH, intends to file a lawsuit against Tesla alleging systematic racial discrimination and harassment. This follows a three-year investigation during which the DFEH, whose mission is supposedly to protect workers, has never once raised any concern about current workplace practices at Tesla. Rather, the lawsuit appears focused on alleged misconduct by production associates at the Fremont factory that took place between 2015 and 2019. Tesla strongly opposes all forms of discrimination and harassment and has a dedicated employee relations team that responds to and investigates all complaints. We also have a diversity, equity, and inclusion team whose work is shown in this public report. Tesla has always disciplined and terminated employees who engaged in misconduct, including those who use racial slurs or harass others in different ways. We recently rolled out an additional training program that reinforces Tesla's requirement that all employees must treat each other with respect and reminds employees about the numerous ways they can report concerns, including anonymously. Above all, Tesla continues to seek to provide a workplace that is safe, respectful, fair, and inclusive, all of which are vital to achieving our mission. Tesla is also the last remaining automobile manufacturer in California. The Fremont factory has a majority-minority workforce and provides the best-paying jobs in the automotive industry to over 30,000 Californians. No company has done more for sustainability or the creation of clean energy jobs than Tesla. Yet, at a time when manufacturing jobs are leaving California, the DFEH has decided to sue Tesla instead of constructively working with us. This is both unfair and counterproductive especially because the allegations focus on events from years ago. Over the past five years, the DFEH has been asked on almost 50 occasions by individuals who believe they were discriminated against or harassed to investigate Tesla. 
On every single occasion, when the DFEH closed an investigation, it did not find misconduct against Tesla. It therefore strains credibility for the agency to now allege, after a three-year investigation, that systematic racial discrimination and harassment somehow existed at Tesla. A narrative spun by the DFEH and a handful of plaintiff firms to generate publicity is not factual proof. Once the DFEH files its lawsuit, Tesla will be asking the court to pause the case and take other steps to ensure that facts and evidence will be heard. To date, despite repeated requests, the DFEH has declined to provide Tesla with the specific allegations or the factual basis for its lawsuit. Attacking a company like Tesla that has done so much good for California should not be the overriding aim of a state agency with prosecutorial authority. The interests of workers and fundamental fairness must come first. Which brings us to the thing that, aside from the breadth of the allegations and the content of the allegations, struck us most while researching this story. Tesla has every right to defend itself and its employees in court and has every right to refute the claims made against it. Thankfully, that's what living in a democracy where the presumption of innocence is a key part of the Constitution means. Every other automaker which has suffered similar allegations has defended itself and made statements to the press and the public about those allegations. Usually they've involved some condemnation of racism, included something about the way in which the company will be working to investigate the allegations fully, cooperating with the external agencies and reinforcing or modifying policies for dealing with racism in the workplace. But in Tesla's case, the statement, while rightly condemning racism and reiterating the work of its diversity and inclusion team, also goes directly after the prosecutors. It uses the adverb supposedly in talking about the DFEH, a word that in this particular case intends to cast doubt on the authenticity and credibility of the investigation team. While Tesla should be rightly praised for reiterating its commitment to creating a workplace that's free from racism, a workplace that is, quote, safe, respectful, fair and inclusive, end quote, its eagerness to dismiss the credibility of the DFEH is not becoming of a company seeking to deny allegations made against it. Worse, it seemingly plays the card that so many accused individuals have over the years. The, but I've done so much good card. The straw man argument here is that because an individual or a company has given money to charity or been a leader in the community or created jobs or been an amazing entertainer or sports person, that somehow the allegations against them should be taken less seriously. And this frankly borders on gaslighting, especially when it reiterates near the end of the post that, quote, attacking a company like Tesla that has done so much for California should not be the overriding aim of a state agency with prosecutorial authority, end quote. We feel that that does nothing to cement Tesla's credibility and feels a little immature rather than considered. Tesla's blog post also disputes DFEH's version of events, which alleges in its court papers that Tesla failed to meet with it as it attempted to resolve the allegations out of court. The DFEH claimed it invited Tesla to participate with its internal dispute resolution division twice in January, once on January 12th and again on January 20th but that Tesla did not attend until a further session that was scheduled for February 8th. One day after, Tesla announced the DFEH investigation in SEC documentation. The very next day, Tesla issued the blog post, which we've just read out, in which it alleges the DFEH sued Tesla instead of, quote, constructively working with us. At this point, it's very much one side against the other, and we should caution that until the legal process has run its due course, both sides should be given the same opportunity to make their case. In Tesla's case, 
without a press department. It has been hard to get further information for this video beyond the quoted blog posts and Elon Musk's Twitter account. But there is one further thing that is important to note, and again, doesn't look good for Tesla. Specifically, during a previous court case in which a former worker sued Tesla for allowing continued racial discrimination in the workplace, a case that was ruled in the prosecution's favour last fall, Tesla tried to have jurors excluded from jury selection processes for racial reasons essentially arguing that a black juror could not be impartial in a racism case involving racial discrimination against African Americans. Again, we place this here for context and note that there's precedent called the Baston Challenge that explicitly forbids the use of preemptory challenges to exclude jurors on the basis of race. But this case is likely to take a while to progress through the courts, and we will, of course, keep you abreast of what we hope will be a comprehensive, thorough and fair trial. If you've reached the end of this video, thank you. We would be grateful if you would consider subscribing and hitting the bell below. And you can support us in what we do by using one of the methods in the description below. Thank you to everyone who has made this video possible through their Patreon or YouTube membership. It is thanks to you that we can produce videos like this, putting our reporting above ad income. Thank you. As usual, with any case like this, we will keep abreast of the situation and we'll report as thoroughly as we can. Until then, thank you again and please keep evolving.